had a great time in the house of the Lord last night. Amen. And uh, sometimes just lingering in the presence of the Lord. Just letting God talk to you. Just letting your heart be open. Don't have to be afraid. Don't have to worry about anything you're saying or doing. You're just giving praise and love to God. Amen. Say again how happy I am to be with your pastor and his family. And, of course, Andrew and Carla, all those Gandy girls and their, their families. We love them and uh, their, their parents. So we're happy to be here today. I'm going to slow it down terribly. Is that all right? <laughs> now, if you know me at all, you know I like the pedal to the metal. I mean, barreling down the interstate, maybe not barreling down the interstate, but in the spirit, I say take the bridle off and let it run. Celebrate everything. Until further notice, celebrate everything. But the Lord directed me to a scripture this morning, and I'm just going to go there. I don't know just who it's for today. I'm not going to try to figure it out. And some of you may think, wow, that's the driest thing I ever heard in my life. But somebody else in the same pew may think, wow. I read in the word of the Lord where Jesus was down by the lake one day. And he raised his voice, said, Father, glorify thy name. And there was a voice that spoke from the heavens and said, I have glorified it and I will. There was a man standing not far off and he said, wow, I heard an angel speaking. The voice of God, something, I heard something heavenly talking. There was a guy standing right beside him that said, dude, that was thunder." There was another guy standing right beside him and said, I ain't heard a thing. That's Bible now. I'm not making that up. So it doesn't worry me too much. I've seen guys on this end of the road having a Holy Ghost fit and a guy down there dozing off. So I understand that everybody receives the word differently. But I'm going to put into you the word that God gave me today. Is that all right? All right, let's go to a really unfamiliar scripture that you probably never hear and uh, hadn't heard much of. Let's go to Acts 2.38. Your pastor ever preached that scripture? The bishop ever preached that scripture, Bishop Stevens? Any of these younger men that preach here occasionally, do they ever, these high-powered evangelists that come through, do they ever preach Acts 2.38? If they don't, they're doing you wrong. This needs to be preached on a regular basis. Praise God. You say, preacher, I've heard it so much. I know the Greek. I don't care if you have. You need to hear it again. It needs to be implanted and imprinted into your spirit. Let me just back up to 37, Acts 2, 37. Now when they heard this, talking about the, the first message preached, after the baptism of the Holy Ghost was poured out, when these people heard this, they were pricked in their heart. In other words, their conscience smote them. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's been the age-old question. What do I need to do? To get myself right with God, what do I need to do? This may not be every step, but it's the first step every time. Amen. Then Peter said to them, repent. Everybody say repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Somebody said one time, how many will God call? The Bible said God has called all men unto repentance. 
He said, unless you repent, you'll all die in your sins. So this is not strange scripture. I'm not going to come with some new revelation, but I'm going to come and maybe present it in a little bit different way than you've heard it before. Let me talk to you about this. From failure to fulfillment. From failure to fulfillment. Turn to your neighbor next door and say, you need to be fulfilled. You can be seated. The promise of the baptism of the Holy Ghost had been prophesied about all through the Old Testament. Time and time again, one of the prophets would get under the inspiration of the Spirit and they would speak out words that the people around them had no comprehension for what they were saying. Joel stood up one day and said, In the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Aren't you glad he said all flesh? He didn't say just on the Jews and just on this one or just on that one. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. That lets every one of us in because we are all flesh. I was at a conference in Salt Lake City one time years ago and we had some guys coming in messing with some of our youth, trying to tell them wrong doctrines and they would grab three or four of our young people and pull them off over in a corner and start shooting false doctrine into them. And some of the ministry got to where they would watch and when they saw that, they would pull them off to the side and say, look, you're welcome to come and listen, but you're not the preacher today. So I saw this couple of guys that grabbed about four or five of our young people and pulled them off in a corner and uh, I walked over there, and just as I got there, this one guy said, I'm not even in the flesh, so I'm not bothered by the flesh. Being the East Texas, formerly Louisiana redneck I am, I reached up under the under, under part of his arm here and caught a little piece of that skin and squeezed it kind of tight. He jumped about three foot high and said, man, what are you doing? I said, you just told us you weren't bothered by the flesh. Appears to me you are bothered by the flesh. And if you don't find a way out of here pretty quick, you're going to be bothered by some more flesh. We don't need your preaching in here. Hey, listen, the flesh has been the problem all along, and it still is. My flesh, your flesh, it don't matter. You can't trust any of it. You can't control it. You, you may be dead, very disciplined, but you got a problem. You see, ingrained within you from the day you are born, actually for more that, when you are first become just a little mass in your mother, when you just begin to form eyeballs, when you begin to form little hands and all of that, it's already implanted into you, into your DNA. It goes all the way back to Adam. There's a rebellious spirit in every person when they're born. There's, there's a spirit that you, if you don't think it's in you when you're born, you get little kids and put them in a room, little kids. And you let somebody knock a vase over and break it. And when you walk in the room and say, what happened? Every kid in the room says, I didn't do it. We learn from the time we take our first breath to deflect punishment to somebody else. I won't be so hard as to say we learned to lie, but we're going to do. I didn't do it. I didn't say it. You see, you're under a curse the moment you're born. Because you all, we all are kinfolks whether you want to admit it or not. And I don't care what color your skin is here today. I'm not into skin color whatsoever. 
My God is not a hide hunter. He's a soul saver. And nobody's better than anybody else. We all go into one of two places. We're going to heaven or we're going to hell. Brother, that's the only two choices there are. And I pray you make the right choice. But we all go back to a common set of ancestors called Adam and Eve. And because of their disobedience in the garden, man has been under a curse ever since. And because of being under that curse, we are constantly flooded with guilt. We're constantly flooded with fears, anxieties, hatred, malice, strife. All of these things are born with us. They're in our flesh. Some people let them out more than others. Some people don't care. They just blurt out anything anywhere they are. I don't think that's a wise thing. But I'm telling you, all of us have within us the ability to be the worst person on the block. We all have the ability to do incredible bad things in life. You may say, well, preacher, I would never do that. You don't know if you would or not. You've never been in the circumstance. You don't have a right to look down on anybody and say, I'm better than them because I don't do what they do. If you get in the right situation, there'll be somebody a step above you that'll look down on you and say, I'd never do what they do. We don't have a right to be better than anybody. We all need God in our lives. We all need the love of God. We all need the blood of Jesus. We all need it, praise God. All started in one family, and we're all going to wind up in one family. Before it's over with, we're all going to be members of one family. Praise God, regardless of what your, your natural lineage is. I'm telling you, it does not matter if it's Hispanic or Afrikaans or, or Irish or Scottish. or what. It does not matter. We all are going to be one body. We're going to be of one spirit. We're going to be of one name. We're going to be of one blood. Praise God. We're all going to be one family. So when Peter stood up, Now, at 6.30 this morning, the Lord woke me up and spoke three words to me. Three words. Failure, formatting, and fulfillment. I rolled over and said, what did you just say at 6.30 in the morning? God don't always look at the clock before he talks to you. For about six months one time, God woke me up at 2 o'clock every morning. And asked me a question. I would just sound asleep. All of a sudden I would wake up and the Lord would ask me a question that he knew I didn't have an answer for. I'd go into my office. I'd sit at my desk. Say, okay, Lord, what, what is it we're talking about? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. And he would begin to open revelation to me about things. Sometimes it was just things I'd been wondering about. God wants to talk to you. If you have ears to hear, God will talk to you. God talked to me this morning about a sister that was in this altar last night. And again this morning, she came up to me in the foyer. I don't see you sitting here, but I know you're here. You came up to me in the foyer last night and said, I want to get back to that place where I have the peace of God. I just want to encourage you. God spoke to me last night after I got back to the room and said, I'm going to put that peace in her and then I'm going to multiply it several times over. You're going to have more peace than you had to start with. You're going to have more of the joy of the Lord than you had to start with, praise God. Not because you got away, but because you came back and you gave your heart to God. So when starting with failure, when these people asked Simon, what what can we do? You see, he just told them the secret of the ages. Standing right outside the garden after Adam and Eve had messed up. The Lord is speaking all these curses. Before that time, they didn't have to work. They didn't have to 
plant anything. They didn't have to pull reeds up. They didn't have to mow the grass. They had to do nothing but just walk around in the garden and eat the apples and eat the grapes and eat this and eat that. They didn't have to do one thing. There was nothing to sting them, nothing to bite them, nothing to make their bodies itch. There was no poison ivy. There was no poison oak. There were no chiggers. There were no ticks. There were no grass burrs. There was no briars. There was nothing. No cactus. Nothing to hurt you in the garden. But because they refused to obey God, God said, now the whole program has changed. For one thing, you can't get back in the garden because the tree of life is there. And I don't want you to go and eat of the tree of life in the condition you're in. Because when you eat of the tree of life, you're going to live forever. And he said, if you go in and eat of it now, you're going to live forever in a confused and a rebellious state and I don't want that there's a day when the door will be opened again to the tree of life and you and I can freely eat of that tree and the fruit of that tree will heal the fruit of that tree will bless the fruit of that tree will give energy and life praise God but today we cannot eat of that tree standing right outside that garden telling them Adam, from now on, you're going to live by the sweat of your brow. You're going to have to plow. You're going to have to plant. There's going to be rain. There's going to be sunshine. There's going to be all this. He looked at the woman and said, you're going to have a hard road to plow too. You're going to, you're going to bear children in pain. Before that, they could have had children and never would have had the pain, praise God. Never would have had any of the inconvenience. Children, generations could have been born in the garden because they were already male and female. But they messed up. They failed. Mankind had lived under failure. God gave them a law. He gave them a set of laws. He gave them a tabernacle plan. And later he gave them the temple plan. He gave them the the, the instructions on how to build a place of worship where they could come and offer sacrifices. They had to be able to remember, well, I I said something wrong, so I got to sacrifice a couple of turtle doves. I I did this wrong, so I got to go sacrifice a bullock. And even when they didn't do anything wrong, they had to go sacrifice a a lamb. It was a life of total and absolute sacrificing because there was sin involved. There was a curse involved. Their flesh was under a curse that they could not get out from under. Nobody was ever justified under the law and nobody's going to be justified under the law today. We don't want to go back under the law because if you fail in one thing in the law, you failed in all of it. Nobody ever was justified by the law and so for thousands of years man lived under a curse it was there all the time the things they did wrong you could look at it and attribute right back to the day when Adam and Eve messed up in the garden and that curse was passed off to every these little children that can't talk yet they're already under a curse You say, oh, now preacher, I can go to the Word of God and I can prove it to you. You are under that curse from the day you are born. You say, well, I'm just going to live a good life. You can't live a life good enough because the curse is in your flesh. The curse is in this old man that we're living in. You can't can't live good enough. You can't live holy enough. You can't abstain from drink, abstain from drugs, abstain from cursing. It does not matter if you live a pure white, lily white life all of your life and die. If you don't repent and get baptized in Jesus' name, you will be lost. That may be a little hard for some of you, but it's absolutely the truth. So there was failure. 
We needed an answer for failure. When they were standing before Peter, the baptism of the Holy Ghost was poured out. They waited and waited and waited. They tarried in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost finally came. God poured out the baptism of the Holy Ghost on 120 people in the upper room. They spoke in tongues. No doubt they shouted some. They, they rejoiced. They got down in the street and they're still talking in tongues. They're still rejoicing. And people are saying, what's going on here? What is this? What, what in the world is happening here? A few weeks ago, they were having that meeting in Asbury. Still may be having I don't know. But Tucker Carlson, one of the commentators, came on that evening. And the first words out of his mouth, he got somebody in Asbury to call him. Got him on the phone. He said, what's going on up there? That's been the question in people's minds ever since the day of Pentecost. What is going on over there? The people looking online this morning saw y'all dancing and jumping and running and clapping your hands. And some of y'all praying. Some of them said, what's going on down there? Come on down and we'll show you what's going on. Come on down and find out for yourself what's going on. God is changing lives. God is changing hearts, praise God. Let's give the Lord a little hand of praise. Peter looked at these people and he knew because he was the same way. Even after he began to follow the Lord, Simon still had a little problem with his temper. He said some words one day he didn't need to say. In the heat of a moment, warming by the wrong fire, Simon cursed and denied that he even knew Jesus. And he'd been following him for three years. But Simon was warming by the wrong fire. And when you get by the wrong fire, you'll say things you don't need to say and do things you don't need to do. You need to make sure what fire you're warming by. Amen. But Peter looked at these people and he said, I know what they've got. They've got failure in their life. What you need for failure is forgiveness. Divine forgiveness. You need the kind of forgiveness only God can give. You need the kind, the Bible said, if we confess our faults unto God, God is faithful and just to forgive our faults and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, praise God. The way to get forgiveness from God is confession and repentance. Repentance is turning around and going a different direction. I've been going north, but I'm going to go south. I've been living a lie, but I'm going to live the truth. I've been living like the devil, but I'm going to do my best to live like God. I know I can't ever in the flesh be good enough, but by the power of God, you can live a life that is satisfying. Everybody say satisfying satisfying to God. Oh, my Lord. Anybody in this building know what I'm talking about when I say you can feel it when that load of guilt is taken away? Brother, I literally felt it. The day that I came down to an altar and prayed, and ask God to forgive me and ask God to cleanse me. I remember so distinctly that load of guilt, that load of condemnation, that load of fear that left me that moment. There was great joy that welled up inside of me because I knew I have been forgiven, praise God. I'm not totally through. There's more to be done, but I don't have to struggle every day under that guilt because God God has washed it, praise God. And here's the beauty of it. Here's the beauty of it. God, I did a study one time on scripturally, what does it say God does with our sins? It's pretty interesting. I had about 20 things out of the Bible that the Bible said God does with our sins. One, the Bible said he cast them behind his back. He didn't want to see them no more. He didn't want to look down at you and see those sins. And so he takes them away from you and he casts them behind his back. 
The Bible said he puts them in the depth of the sea. He don't just throw them in the water. He puts them in the bottom. He goes to the deepest hole in the deepest part of the ocean and puts your sins in the deepest hole there is on the planet. He casts them not just in the sea, but in the depths of the sea. One place the Lord said, come and let us reason together. But I think God's a little unreasonable when it comes to sin because he goes way beyond the ordinary, way beyond the normal, way beyond what anybody really needs. He goes that far to get rid of your sins. And he said this, I will remember them no more. Now, the Bible said God knows the end from the beginning. In Revelation, he gave to John all of these instructions to write to the churches. And he described how it was going to be in the last hours of this world's existence. He went on to say that there's coming a time when the very elements themselves will melt with a fervent heat. He said the heavens will roll up like a rug or a scroll. There's a day coming when this planet won't exist anymore. It's going to burst into flame and burn to a crisp. There won't be another earth. It'll be gone. But thanks be to God, there's a new heaven and a new earth that you and I are going to where nobody's ever lived before. We got a mansion waiting over there with our names. Oh, you ought to clap your head to the Lord. I'm telling you the truth. He said, you've got to repent. That that means go to God and ask forgiveness and then declare to God, I won't live the way I used to live. Brother, I'm so happy I don't live how I used to live. I'm so glad I don't say the things I used to say. I'm so glad I don't do the things I used to do. I lived my life in the world for 23 years. I wasn't raised in church. I didn't hardly ever go to church. I said things. I did things. I get on the job sometimes. I'm a, I've am been a builder and sometimes have 150 men on a project. And some of those guys will string out these big, long cuss words and think they're impressing me. I look at them and say, I know the word. I know how it's used and where to use it. Better than you do, maybe. But I don't need it anymore. I don't have to use it anymore. Had a guy on one of my projects one time from Kentucky. They call them briars. We were in Ohio and he came into my office one day. Come tearing into my office, big old boy. And he's cussing every other word as a cuss word. I said, whoa, time out, time out, time out. Go back out that door. And when you come in, you talk to me like you think I got good sense. He said, what? I said, I don't need all the cuss words. If you can't just say it and let it stand, it's not worth my time. Leave all the other extra stuff out and tell me what you got going on. He said, I have a need, Mr. Superintendent. I said, tell me what the need is. He told me. I said, it'll take me five minutes to take care of it. It took you that long to tell me. I walked down. I said, come on, go with me. Got my hard hat, went down, found the fellas that were doing what we shouldn't have been doing, explained to them how it was going to be done. I said, you should have looked at the blueprints. You should have looked at at the technical specs. You should have looked at all that. You'd know this is not the way to do it. I turned to him and said, is there anything else? No, Mr. Superintendent. He was being smart. Then he found out I was a preacher. And from then on, I was Reverend Superintendent. Really, I was Rev. Hey, Rev, when they call you Rev, you know it's not good. They're not really meaning anything respectful. But you know what? He was on that job 18 months. And the last week of that job, he came to my office, closed the door, and sat down. And he said, I I need to talk to you. I said, what's the deal? He said, my wife and I were having a discussion last night. And she said, Honey, I need to make something clear to you and ask you a question. 
He said, what? She said, what did you do with my husband? What happened to you? He said, what are you talking about? She said, do you realize it's been a year since I heard you say a cuss word? It's been a year since you used one out in the barn or in the house or wherever. I haven't heard you say one. What happened? He said, preacher, I'm telling you, you happened. He said, I got to watching you and realizing I don't want to be the man I used to be. I don't want to talk like I used to talk. I don't want to act the way I used to. I said, thank you, Lord, that somebody noticed I'm trying. I've not always been a thousand, but I'm trying, praise God. And it changed somebody's life, praise God. Oh, we ought to give the Lord a hand of praise. You've done the same thing. People have saw you change, praise God. I got a chance that day to tell him about Acts 2.38. I got a chance that day to tell him about the love of God. I got a chance that day to explain to him why I changed and how I changed. Peter said, repent. That's the way to get real of the failing nature. That's the way to, that's the step you need to take. That's what you need. If you're in this building today, you've never received the Holy Ghost. You've never been baptized in Jesus' name. You're still struggling with the old man that you are. I know you are because I used to hate me. I used to hate me. I used to say things. I'd blow up. I'd lose my temper. I'd get into fights. I'd do all kinds of stuff and then go home and hate me for being so crazy to do the things I was doing. I told myself one day, man, you're going to get shot if you don't straighten up. Somebody's going to pull a gun and shoot a hole in you. But thank God I found somebody to tell me how to change this old failed nature and get it lined up with the plan of God. You're here today. I'm going to tell you, you know, there's, there's times where we have very emotional conversions. But there's other times when it's not very emotional. It's just simply doing what you know you need to do. It's just simply taking the steps you know you need to take. It don't always have to be with a shout. It don't have to always be with a bounce. You can just simply walk up and say, Preacher, I'm tired of being me. I want to be a new man. I want to be a new creature. I want to be a new woman. I want to be a new husband, new wife. I want to be better than what I was yesterday. I want to be better than what I was this morning when I woke up. Oh, I'm telling you, the power of God's real to help help you do it. Clap your hands to the Lord all over the building. The answer for failure is repenting. Simply ask God to forgive you. You don't have to do it in a fancy way. You don't have to do it loud. You know, when I first got the Holy Ghost, I guess I thought God was hard of hearing because I didn't know but one way to pray. At the top of my lungs. And my wife said, honey, I can't bear it any longer. You got to go in the living room and pray, and I'll pray in the bedroom. You're driving me up a wall. So I went in the living room, and me and God had a time, and she stayed in the bedroom, and her and God had a time. I finally realized God is not hard of hearing. God can hear me when I'm not stripping my voice out. And I learned how to just pray a simple prayer failure needs repentance then there's another word that God gave me this morning formatting formatting some of you say preacher what is formatting I'm not going to even try to impress you with my wisdom I'm not going to try to make you think I'm a computer guru because there's some computer gurus in here that will laugh at me but I'm going to tell you that formatting many times applies to a computer or a printer or some kind of other device that can print or copy pieces of paper. And formatting, when you get a computer, you go down and buy a laptop, it's already been formatted most of the time. 
It's already determined what kind of, they call it font, how the letters will look on the page, whether they'll be fancy or plain. It's already been formatted as to what will be bold and what will be light. It's already been formatted probably for you and how the letters, how the pages will look, how the paragraphs will look, if they're double spaced or single spaced. Oh, I know we're getting a lot of stuff in here, but I, I'm telling you something, I'm going somewhere. You can get that computer and reformat it if you don't like the way it was set up from the factory or from the store wherever you bought it you can reformat it you can make the letters look different you can make the paragraphs look different you can make one paragraph look one way and another paragraph look another way that sectional programming or, or formatting praise God you can make the margins wide or you can make them narrow you can make the spaces between the you can determine for yourself how it wants to be and unless you change it every time you put a letter in it it'll come out looking like you made it to look it'll come out looking the way you formatted it formatting means making a decision for how you want things to look in the future Formatting means you're making them line up with all the other letters you've got in your, your, your file cabinet. This new letter is going to look just like it because you formatted it. You told the computer, this is how I want you to do it. It's not going to do it. If it does different, take it back and let them work on it. Praise God, something's wrong. Because you made the decision how it would look and you set it up. And when you, every time you print it, it looks the same way. You got control. I never feel like when I sit at my computer, I got control. Because I go in there a lot of times and I'm in a hurry, and it ain't. I go in and turn that computer on, and man, I'm ready to type, and it's going, mm. I'm, and I'm saying, come on, dude. I got to get this typed out. Come on. I got to get this letter sent. Come on. I got an email I need to type, and it's just sitting there. And I bang it. Bam! Now straighten up and do what I said do. And it don't do nothing. Then I got to take it in and get it repaired. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you if anybody in here knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> A computer is one thing that can get back in the flesh quicker than anything I know. When it starts messing up, it's a mess. But you format it. When Peter looked at them and said, Repent. And be baptized every, every, somebody say everyone. Every one of you. Every one of you. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission. The cutting away. The doing away with your sins. Well, he said, format your life. You make the decision. If you get baptized in Jesus, now I want to read scripture to you. I told you a while ago, one of these days we're going to all be of one family. Let me read this scripture to you. In the book of Ephesians, when people teach about baptism, they don't always go get this one, but they should. You young preachers, write this down. You need this. When you're teaching on baptism, look in Ephesians, the third chapter, the 14th verse. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family, everybody say whole family, whole family in heaven and earth is named. Did you get that? Paul said the whole family of God, the ones already in heaven, and the ones in earth, if you're in the family of God, you've got the name of Jesus on you. How'd you get it on you? You got baptized in water. In the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody puts you under water in Jesus' name. Praise God. And when you come out of there, you got a new last name. My name is Pat Phillips, Jesus. Kurt Green, Jesus. Laurie Green, Jesus. Carla, oh my Lord, and Andrew. 
Jesus, praise God, I'm telling you now, you got to have that name on you. If you're going to be in the family of God, you're going to have the name of Jesus applied to your life. I used to belong to a church where we didn't baptize in Jesus' name. Matter of fact, I was, I was a church member for about seven or eight months before I realized that anybody got baptized in any different ways. But our church baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's Babel, Matthew 28, 19. That's what Jesus said. Some people say, I'm going to do what Jesus said. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what the Bible said the first members of the church did because they did what Jesus told them to do. Jesus' name, Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. So you know his name is Jesus. And because he came in the Father's name, you know the Father's name is Jesus. Somebody said, well, what about the Holy Ghost? What is the Holy Ghost? Bible tells me it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Holy Ghost is Christ coming to live inside of you. What is Christ's name? Christ's name is Jesus. The name of the Father is Jesus. The name of the Son is Jesus. The name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. And when you get that revelation, you're going to understand they're all one. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. My Father and I are one. They're not different. They're one, praise God. The Bible said all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Christ Jesus, praise God. Oh, my, we, we could get excited over that. We could clap our hands a little bit over that. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up, neighbor. We're going to get good here now. Wake up, neighbor. we got a little ways to go. Praise God. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 2, the Jews were baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 8, the Samaritans were baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 10, the Gentiles were baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 19, the disciples of John the Baptist were baptized in Jesus' name. They'd already been baptized under John's baptism, but Paul re-baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody said, preacher, do I need to be re-baptized? If you were not baptized in Jesus' name, you need to be re-baptized. Somebody ought to say amen. Somebody that's been there ought to say, I was baptized, but I got rebaptized in Jesus' name. How many in this building will tell me I was baptized another way, but there came a day when I got rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Praise God. Look at all of them. Look at them. Thank God. You're formatting. Let me tell you something about your children. There was a drawing here this morning of the little people. There was a drawing of little children coming up wanting God. I've been seeing this everywhere I've gone lately. I was in all city preaching for three weeks. And the last weekend I was there, we prayed through four of those little ones. There was a whole bunch of them came to the altar one night right by themselves. Nobody brought them. They just came to the altar, began to pray, began to seek God. There's a drawing in the Holy Ghost right now that is powerful, and little people are feeling it really strong right now. They're really feeling drawn to God. You ought to be thankful for that. You ought to be glad for that. When that little one wants to come to the altar, when the little one wants to come up and worship, don't let them play hide and seek around the altars but let them praise God let them worship God let them learn to be an apostolic praiser let them learn praise God in the Old Testament there was a man named Jacob he had a rich powerful relationship with God known as one of the forefathers one of the predecessors of all of the Hebrews Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob later became Israel. Jacob called 12 young men into his home one day. Ten of them were his sons. Two of them were grandsons. 
He called them in one day and set them down. And Brother Green, he began to prophesy to these young men what their life would be like from that day forward. He told them, this is going to be your life. This is how life is going to treat you. And not only did it happen to them, but generations that came after them. What Jacob told them that day, he formatted their life. He put into place what was going to be in their life, in their home, in their children, in their grandchildren. Jacob spoke it, and ten generations later, they're still living what Jacob lived. I believe in patriarchal blessing. I believe in patriarchal prophecy. I believe that grandpas can speak into grandchildren. I believe that daddies and mamas can mow. My Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Bombers and daddies can speak to your children and their lives will turn out the way you said. Come on, lift your hands and love the Lord. Matter of fact, I can, I can bring it to your Bible and line it up for you. You are formatting your children when you baptize them in Jesus' name. When they get big enough to understand that our children don't have to be. Somebody said that they got to be 12 before they get baptized. No Bible for that. No Bible for that. Well, the age of accountability, no Bible for that either. None at all. Our children get into the presence of God a lot more than most kids do. Our children get the, the glory of the Lord around them a lot more. I thank God when our kids go to bed at night, the angels of the Lord are encamped about them. I thank God when they go to bed at night, hell can't reach in and get into their little mind or into their heart, but the angels of the Lord are all around them, praise God. When they get five or six or seven, and they want to get baptized. Mom and daddy, you do what you want to do, but if it was me, I'd baptize them. Both of my kids were baptized at five and both got the Holy Ghost at six. Praise God. I thank God that God deals with our children a lot sooner than he does other kids. We don't have to wait for a bar mitzvah. We don't have to wait for 12 years old. We don't have to wait for 13 years old. We don't have to wait for any of that. Our kids get stirred by the hand of God and you are formatting them when you baptize them in Jesus' name. The way you format your computer, you tell it, I want you to print the letters just like this. And every one that comes out is printed just that way. Children that are not even born yet can be imprinted with the handprint of God. Children that are still growing inside a mama's body can learn the voice of God. Children that are still being formed. The Bible said, oh my Lord, David said, while I was yet being formed in my mother's womb, your hand was upon me. You wrote down all my parts in your book, praise God. I'm telling somebody God's got his hand in first somebody told me one day you don't understand we have a generational curse in my family I said I don't, I don't believe in generational curses I think that's a cop out oh no 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 grandpa was a drunk so I'm a drunk grandma cussed so I cuss that's hogwash God had his hand on you while you were still in the womb before grandma ever cursed around you, before grandpa ever got drunk in your presence, before any of that ever happened, the hand of the mighty God is already on your child. The hand of God's already, whoa, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. God imprinted them in the womb, praise God. Can we lift our hands and love him a minute in Jesus' name? Is this all right? I'm sorry if it's dry to you. I, yeah, the, the pastor preached next week, and he'll jump and holler, may jump up on this rostrum and preach to you at the top of his lungs. That's fine. But today I'm bringing you what God told me to bring you. Failure needs repentance. By baptism in Jesus' name, you put your children into the family of God. Wow, I feel something in the Holy Ghost. 
there's a spirit right now that's going berserk in this room. There's a false spirit that's going berserk in this room. Somebody in here is believing lies, and I take dominion of it in Jesus' name. I command it in the outer darkness never to talk to you again. I'm telling you under the auspices of the power of the living God that the name of Jesus is the only saving name. That's what the angel told Mary. Name that boy Jesus for he shall save his people. Praise God. Clap your hands all over the building to the Lord. Hallelujah. A demonic spirit just left here. <laughs> they have no choice. I said they have no choice. Demons have no choice whatsoever. They have to leave. If you're praying for somebody and they start saying things they shouldn't and you command them in Jesus' name to be quiet, they don't have a devil. They got a, or just an aggravating spirit. We were going to church in Houston one time. This is kind of, kind of crazy. Kind of on the outside. I'm bringing it'll be free. I won't charge you for it. We had a big old boy about your size. Had a little old wife about your size, and he was bad about beating her up. He'd black her eye, bloody her nose. Come to church. They started coming to church. The little wife prayed through. I think she was doing it in self-defense. Uh, maybe God will take care of him or something. I don't know. But she prayed through the Holy Ghost. And, oh, I won't call his name. He may be looking one day or something. I don't know. Anyway, this old boy, he, was, he, he worked at these little convenience stores, and he would look at these pornographic magazines and get all messed up. Devils get all stirred. He would come to church. And, bro, he'd come in and sit somewhere maybe right around here, right on the edge. And he would sit there with his arms folded like this. You'd go by and talk to him, he'd snap at you. Church start, he just sit there, wouldn't worship, wouldn't do nothing. Preacher start preaching, he'd start going, mm, mm, like a mad bull or something. Somebody would go by and say, come on, brother, let's go pray. Let's go pray, brother. We'd go down to the altar. Everybody gather around, pray for this brother. He's, he's having trouble. Devil's attacking him again. And this guy would get in and go, hmm. And all of a sudden, he'd go berserk. He'd start kicking. He'd start hitting. He'd start spitting. He'd start cussing. And we're all just, be, you know, we're good church brothers. Come on, brother. Be, come on, brother. Don't be doing that stuff. Come on, brother. And he'd give us one solid flogging on a regular basis, wanting us to believe he had a devil. I got tired of it. I'm not taking much flogging. <laughs> I told the pastor, I said, Pastor, I'm going to check his spirit. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm, if that's a devil, I'm going to know it's a devil. If it's not a devil, I'm going to know it's not a devil. So it happened that Thursday night. He came to church, sat there. Mm. So I said, let's go pray. He went down and prayed, and he starts going, mm. and I crawled up real close to him. Put my arm around him and squeezed a little snug. I said, brother, this is Pat Phillips. If you spit on me tonight, or you hit me tonight, or you kick me tonight, you better think you better hope I think it's a devil, because if I don't think it's a devil, I'm gonna break your jaw. <laughs> he got up and went and sat down. <laughs> Never did it again. Wasn't no devil. It was just a bad attitude that wanted to show off. Hey, folks, I'm going to tell you what. We know when it's the devil when it's not. 
We know how to handle devils. We can command devils to be quiet. They have to be quiet. We can command devils to be still. They have to be still. We can command devils away. They can't stay. Everybody say they can't stay. They have no choice. They're totally obedient to faith in Jesus' name. Clap your hand to the Lord. Let me tell you about the third word that God gave me this morning, fulfillment. You see, here's the problem. The flesh is still the flesh. Look at your neighbor and say, the flesh is still the flesh. But you can get forgiveness for all the things you've done in the past. But just in your flesh, you may or probably won't have the strength to stay that way. Because the flesh will want to rise back up. He'll want to get back up and have his way again. And because it's been so easy to let it go in the past, you will find yourself letting go again and saying things and doing. So we needed something in our flesh to give us the strength to overcome the flesh. That's where the Holy Ghost comes in. That's where the power of God comes in. That's where the, oh my Lord of heaven, I feel the Holy Ghost. That's where the Spirit of God coming to live inside of you gives you the power not to be the man you used to be, not to be the woman you used to be. The Holy Ghost rises up on the inside and says, no. That's why Paul could say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Brother, you got a spirit inside of you that's not subject to the flesh, but the flesh is subject to the spirit. Praise God. That's why you got churches like this that are full of power. Because God can give you the ability to live all week long without sinning. You see, there's another lie that's been told. Oh, I have to sin every day. That's a lie. You don't have to lie every day. You don't have to lust every day. You don't have to give in to the flesh every day. Greater is he that's in me than he's in the world. I, I, and, and it's okay. It's okay. And at the end of the day, when you lay your head on the pillow, say, thank you, Lord, you helped me not to sin today. Somebody said, but there's sins of commission and sins of omission. That's a bunch of hogwash too. I'm telling you now, if you do wrong, the God of heaven, when you get the Holy Ghost, will tell you before you do it that you're doing wrong. He don't wait till after. He tells you before. He said, you better settle down. You're fixing to say something you shouldn't. You better settle down. You're going to do something you shouldn't. You better not go down that alley. You're going to do something you shouldn't. You better not get in that car with that man. You may not get in that car with that woman. God tells you before you mess up, you're about to mess up so you don't have to mess up. You can say, no, thank you, I'm not getting in there. No, thank you, I'm not going there. No, thank you, I'm not saying that. And at the end of the day, you can jump and dance and praise God because the Holy Ghost allowed me to live all day without sinning. There's no condemnation. There's no fear. There's no guilt. There's none of that stuff. Oh, sir, do you believe what I'm telling you? Apostolics, you believe what I'm telling you? You got call, my Lord. You got victory. You got victory. You got victory. Why? Because you're not the man you used to be. A new creature in Christ. Somebody say, in Christ. There's a lady in this congregation today. You've been listening. Oh, my. You, if you had four ears, you couldn't listen any harder than you have with those two. Because when you walked in this door today, you came in with fear and guilt and condemnation in your life. And I'm telling you right here, in five minutes' time, all of that can leave. It don't take all day. It don't take all night. We don't have to pray with you a year. We don't have to pray with you six months. No, 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 That's the, if you pray in six months, something's wrong. You're not understanding grace. You're not understanding that the blood has washed you. The blood has cleansed you. God wrote it off. God erased it out of the books. It's all gone, praise God.
Everything you say, do, or think is written in a book. But when you repent and the blood washes over you, it takes everything out of the book. Somebody said, no, it just it makes a, no, it don't make an X across it. It would still be there with an X on it. It takes it out of the book. I heard this little thing. It said one time the devil went to the Lord and said, Lord, you heard old John. You know what he said. The Lord said, I don't remember anything John said. Come on, Lord, you, you know everything. You know the end from the beginning. You know what John said. When did he say it? Last month. Oh, well, John came last week and repented. I don't remember what he said. The devil said, well, get your book. It's written in the book. And the Lord picked the book up and opened it up, and there's John's name. He said, I'm sorry, there's something red all over the page. It looks like blood. I can't read anything under it. I don't know what John said. I don't know what Susie did. I don't know how they used to live. I don't know how they used to act. All I know is they've got the Holy Ghost now and they're pleasing me. They're making me happy. I'm glad to be living in them. Let's stand. My musicians, will you come? Stand all over the building. <laughs> Hallelujah. I feel the joy of the Lord. I feel the joy of the Lord. I feel somebody about to open up and say, Jesus, I want everything you got for me. It's, it's, it's got to be more than just believe it. It's got to be more. You see, I learned personally that it's got to be more than walking down and shaking the preacher's hand it's got to be more than saying I believe because the Bible said the devils believe if you're not doing anything more than the devil's doing you're not getting anywhere Fred it's more than believing it's receiving but when you start believing the power of God's going to get involved and you're going to start receiving praise God it's a lot more than just saying, I want my name in the book. I want to be able to vote. No, it's getting your name in the Lamb's book of life. When you repent, when you're baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, your name is written in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. And when this world is burning and when hell is scorching, you're not going to be there. Aren't you happy about that? I said, you're not going to be there. If you've never repented, you simply need to come down here and say, God, I'm sorry for everything I said, thought, and done. I'm sorry for all of it. I want you to cleanse me. I want you to forgive me. The minute, the minute, the minute you do it, everything you've done before, you might have been standing on a street corner in downtown Austin yesterday selling your body to buy drugs. But if you come to this altar today and ask God to forgive you, that whole thing gets washed away. That whole picture gets painted in red. And nobody, not even God, can remember where you were yesterday. You come and ask Him to forgive you, He cleanses you. You come and say, Brother Green, I want to format my life. I want to put my children in Jesus' name. I want to get my family in the family of God. I want to make sure when that trumpet sounds and God calls all of his children, I want my children going. I want my brother going. I want my sister going. I want my husband going. I want me going. Baptized in Jesus' name and then filled with the Holy Ghost. Friend, I'm going to tell you what. I've preached funerals before. I've been in the hospital room when people died that didn't have God. And I have felt some incredibly fearful things happen in that room. I've watched the eyes of people bug out before they left this world because they knew I have forfeited my chance for heaven because they refused to pray or be baptized or do anything. I've also stood there when someone full of the Holy Ghost left here. 
I've literally felt the angels fill up the room. I've watched a smile on their face and their eyes light up. They take one more breath and close their eyes and go to be with Jesus. I've been there. More than once I've felt it when the angels came and got them and took them away. There's not another feeling in the world like that. Oh, I got no question whatsoever about where they went. I got no question whatsoever about what's going on now. They close their eyes here and open them there. That's what death is to a saint of God. I don't fear it whatsoever. I'm not going out looking for it, but I don't fear it. Because that's going to be the avenue. Unless the rapture happens, we're all going to go through that door one day. But brother, you don't have to fear death. The sting has been taken out of it. The power has been taken away from it. And now when you realize, I got diagnosed with cancer three years ago. I've told the story before, but I got re-diagnosed last week. I'm free. <laughs> I don't have any cancer. The man said, come back and see me in six months. You're doing fine. All the numbers look great. I've got a God that understands all of that. But when they told me, no fear. None at all. I told my wife, baby, it's okay. And God spoke to her in an audible voice and said, I've got this. I've got this. He didn't say he's got this. He said, I've got this. If you've got the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name and you've been living for God, death holds no fear for you. It's just going to be the avenue to get into that other world. It's just going to be that elevator that takes me from here to there. I'll close my eyes here, and the next second I'll open them up, and I'll be there. That's what the Bible tells me. Don't go looking for me in a cemetery. My body will reside there for a little while until the rapture, and then God will bring that body, and we'll be joined together again in a new body. It won't ever die again. It won't ever have anything else again. Oh, on that side, there is no cancer. On that side, there is no strokes. On that side, there is no heart attack. On that side, there's no tears because the lamb reaches up and wipes them away. Just for a moment today, I'm going to open these altars. I, I know it's 1248, 45, I'm sorry. If you're late for lunch, I, I apologize. Not really. I brought you what I felt like God wanted you to have. If you need to go, you feel like going, you go. But I'm going to ask just for a moment anybody that would like to come forward and say, Lord, I want my life changed. I need to pray. I need to repent. I need to be baptized in Jesus' name. I, there's water up there. There's robes up there. There's towels up there. It doesn't matter if you don't, have, you don't have any new clothes. Just take those off, put a robe on, and get in and get baptized and get ready because the power of God's coming. Praise God. Would everybody in the building lift their hands and love the Lord with me right now in Jesus' name? In Jesus' name, if you're here today and you never received the Holy Ghost, but you'd like to have the Holy Ghost come and let God work a work in your life. If you're here today and never been baptized, you need to come. Talk to this pastor and he'll tell you what you need to do. Come and talk to these ministers and they'll help you. Praise God. I, I, I'm inviting anybody in the building. If you have a need today in God, just for a few more minutes today and then we'll leave here. We'll go on and do whatever you need to do. But right now, God is talking to somebody in this building. I want you to lift your hand and begin to talk to him. 
I want you to lift your hand and begin to tell him, Lord, I want to be forgiven. Lord, I want to be clean. Lord, I want you to take all of my sins away. Oh, come on, come on. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. That's why I'm preaching what I'm preaching. If you've had something bothering you in your spirit, well, you may have the Holy Ghost, but you've allowed the flesh to rise back up. Come on down today and just say, Lord, I've been a little weak, but I need that strength from inside to give me grace to overcome come the outside. God, I need you to help me today. Come on, church. Come on, church. We're going to quit in just a minute. Maybe I shouldn't have told you what time it was, but come on, just for a few minutes, let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name,